Hi everyone and welcome back to this week's episode of Super Sports Science proudly brought to you by EliteForm.com. If you're into your velocity-based training, make sure you look them at EliteForm.com. Also, every week Skip has the cocktail hour, which is 4 p.m. in the US or 7 a.m. in Australia on Instagram TV. So he usually interviews someone, usually a strength and conditioning coach or someone in the sporting field of interest. So make sure you check that one out. It's really quite insightful, and I find Skip really does a good job at interviewing people and teasing out some great work that they're currently doing. On to this week's episode. Well, actually, this series of ischemic preconditioning. Two weeks ago, I introduced the concept of ischemic preconditioning, and I had PhD scholar Sam Halley on, who spoke about the background behind ischemic preconditioning and then spoke about one of his papers, which hopefully by now should be actually published on the effectiveness of ischemic preconditioning and kayaking. If you haven't listened to it yet, it was really insightful that he could use ischemic preconditioning in pretty elite level kayakers around performance and that the more times you did it before you perform, the better you'd perform. So something really to consider that is really easy and applicable in a sporting environment. There's no cost to you or there's no energy cost to you, which I think is really exciting. As I said last week, I want to go through three or four different concepts on how you can use ischemic preconditioning. In particular, this episode, I wanted to focus on the role of ischemic preconditioning and resistance exercise. Therefore, the paper I actually chose is quite a recent paper. It's 2020, so it's this year. It's quite fresh and it appeared in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research. And it is called Ischemic Preconditioning Improves Resistance Training Session Performance. And this is from the researchers out of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And Jefferson da Silva Nuovas was the primary author here. Now, there's actually a few papers already out there on the role of ischemic preconditioning and resistance exercise. However, I did choose this one for a specific reason, and I'll get towards it at the end. And hopefully, as I explain it, you might be able to guess as to the reason why that I chose it. As per the last podcast, which introduced the concept of ischemic preconditioning, it's a technique where you have that alternating moments of vascular occlusion and subsequent reperfusion in a remote or a non-invasive method. And this is typically used for the application of a pneumatic tourniquet. The other real good uses of ischemic preconditioning has been around health outcomes and primarily health outcomes over the past 30 years. And amongst others, it's been demonstrated that IPC can induce protection in cardiac, such as the delay of lethal cell injury and also in skeletal muscle and reduced ischemic necrosis and low energy metabolism during sustained ischemia. So although I'm focusing on the role of ischemic preconditioning or IPC and exercise, there's actually some really good general health benefits. And it's actually given me an idea of one of the last papers I'll probably review for you all. Now, in my mind, when I've read a few papers around IPC, it's really looked in the context of exercise that's focused on performance and aerobic and glycolytic dominant type activities. Although there has been a bit on resistance exercise. The majority of the work, in my opinion, is focused on this aerobic type activities. If you look at the studies of IPC on resistance exercise, there has been a few, but they're limited to examining the effects of IPC on single joint exercises or isolated limbs. And when you think about an actual resistance training session, it traditionally consists of around five to eight exercises. And these are often multi-joint exercises and they involve all major upper and lower body musculature. And that's definitely something that I would prescribe to athletes that I coach, is that they would have five to eight exercises, and traditionally, they'd be multi-joint. Therefore, this is the reason that drew me to this paper. The aim of the study was to investigate the acute effect of IPC for resistance exercise training session on the number of repetitions performed, the total volume of work performed, and the rating of perceived exertion in recreational trained men. If we look at the structure of the actual study that they did here, each subject completed five lab visits within three days of recovery between each visit. At the first visit, they did all their necessary consent forms and their pre-activity 
anthropometry and also they did one RM test. And in particular, this was completed for all the exercises that was also included in the session. Therefore, they did a one RM test for the bench press, a leg press at 45 degrees, a front lateral pull down, hack machine, assuming the hack machine's actually a squat, a shoulder press and a back squat exercise. They had three days rest. On the second visit, they actually performed a one RM test again for each exercise. And then they had visit three, four and five. And at this point here, the subjects completed the following three experimental protocols in a randomized and counterbalanced order. The first one was no IPC. So this was the control where they just sat there and they then did the resistance exercise session. The second one was IPC using a pneumatic cuff at 220 mils of mercury, followed by resistance exercise. And the third group was called the cuff group. And this was the sham. So it's similar to the IPC cuff group where they sat there and the cuff was only inflated to 20 mils of mercury. Therefore, three different conditions. Firstly, control, nothing. The second one was the proper ischemic preconditioning using 220 mils of mercury on the upper body. And the third group was the cuff group where the cuff was only inflated to 20 mils of mercury. Once again, this was called the sham condition. With respects to the subjects, there was 16 recreational resistance exercise trained athletes with around five years of experience. Now, overall, it's pretty nice to go into a little bit more detail of the subjects. With respect to height, they were on average 176 centimeters and the body mass around the 78 kilos plus or minus seven kilos. If you look at their training history, once again, five years, now their bench press was just over one times body weight their leg press was about three and a half times body weight and lat pull down was just over one times body weight. So it's quite good that they had a nice balance between a push and a pull. Hack machine, assuming that's a squat type machine, was about one and a half times body weight. Shoulder press, just under the body weight. And the Smith machine squat for one RM was just over body weight. Now in an athletic population, we would be trying to achieve probably high numbers in this and in particular if we look at a squat versus a bench press we typically hope that the athletes that we train would be squatting significantly more than they would be bench pressing however we do understand that getting elite athletes in these type of studies is problematic due to their own training however when we look at this they're at least lifting with the upper body one times body weight or slightly more which i think is a good thing that they were actually able to put into the paper as I mentioned earlier, they did a one repetition maximum test for all the exercises. And this was done on two different occasions with three days rest. The experimental conditioning, just going over that again briefly, they had three different visits. And what they would do here is they'd have a standardized warm up, And this would be two sets of 15 repetitions on the bench press exercise, which was the first exercise in the resistance exercise protocol with 50% of the one RM load and one minute's rest. And then after that, they got into the whole session where they did three sets of each exercise at 80% of one RM, which was performed until concentric muscular failure. 90 seconds rest intervals separated each set and two minute rest intervals separated each exercise. The resistance extra protocol consisted of in order, bench press, leg press at 45 degrees, pull down, hack machine, shoulder press, and back squat. The number of repetitions for each set of each exercise was recorded. The total volume was determined as the product of the total number of repetition and externally applied load. In other words, total number of reps times load for each exercise. With respect to the ischemic preconditioning and the cuff protocols, this consisted of four cycles of five minute occlusions at 220 mils of mercury for the IPC group or 20 mils of mercury for the cuff or the sham group. They used a pneumatic tourniquet, which was nine centimeters wide. Now, if anyone's used to doing any kind of occlusion work, 220 mils of mercury at a nine centimeter wide cuff on the upper body is quite extreme. So what they're trying to do here 
is they're trying to achieve full occlusion for the five minutes, which typically follows most ischemic preconditioning protocols out there. After the five minutes of occlusion, they'd have then five minutes of reperfusion at zero mils of mercury, and their subjects remain seated for the whole 40 minutes duration of the IPC procedure. Any of the data that they collected during this experiment was the rate of perceived exertion, and this was a scale of zero to 10. And this was taken at the first two visits, but more importantly, during visits three through to five, where they did three different types of protocols, the rate of perceived exertion was measured at the end of the third set of each exercise. Now, remembering that they're going to concentric muscular failure on each set. Once again, here, they're doing three resistance exercise protocols of six exercises to concentric failure under three different conditions. Firstly, the IPC group, which is that 220 mils of mercury on the upper body or the arm. The second one is the cuff group, which is at 20 mils of mercury, or that's the sham group. And the third one is control, which is nothing. And the actual time length prior to the session is 40 minutes. Moving on to the results now, if we look at firstly the 1RM test retest, they actually had high intraclass correlation coefficients for all the six different tests at 0.95 or higher. Uh, just as a side point, I don't know about yourself out there, but if you were to ask me to bench press heavy with three days rest in between, I'd be no good. I typically find I need at least one week's rest of minimal activity before I could contemplate bench pressing anything decent or actually anything decent of used to when I squat or Olympic lift or so forth. But anyway, that's my side point and that's probably the difference between recreational trained athletes and at the time when I was lifting heavy, I guess a well-trained heavy strength athlete. The more important information is what we really want to know with respect to the number of repetitions and the total volume. If we look at the number of repetitions that were performed within each exercise, when we look at the first set, the number of reps performed was significantly higher in the IPC group compared with both the cuff and the control group for five of the exercises. And this was bench press, leg press, pull down, hack machine, and shoulder press. And was also significantly greater in the IPC group compared to with the control only for the back squat. When we look at the second set, we had a similar kind of theme here where the number of reps performed was significantly higher in the IPC group when compared with, again, the cuff and the control group for the same five exercises. And also the number of repetitions in the third set was significantly higher in the IPC group when compared with the cuff and the control group for only four exercises. And this was the bench press, the leg press, the pull down, and the shoulder press. Therefore, overall, we had a significantly higher number of repetitions in total for IPC versus both cuff and control for a majority of the exercises. Again, here, Jared and I usually say, go to the paper because that really goes into greater detail with the specifics of which exercise and to what kind of numbers. When we look at the total volume, that's the total number of repetitions multiplied the load for each exercise. This was significantly higher in the IPC group compared with the cuffs and also the control for at least four to five different exercises. Now, I could actually name each one, but I think by the end of it, me rambling on, I would have lost you. So once again, go to the paper and have a look. However, across the board, it's significantly higher when you use IPC compared with the cuffs and also control. So once again, some really good outcomes there for IPC. Rate of perceived exertion, this was significantly increased after each exercise. However, no differences were observed between the protocols or all three protocols or the exercises. And just my side point here is, is that if you're asking someone to go to maximum contraction failure, is that I think RP is going to be quite high no matter what the condition. Overall, the main findings was that using an ischemic preconditioning treatment on the upper body at 220 mils of mercury using a nine centimeter wide pneumatic cuff was able to result in a greater number of repetitions completed than when a low pressure IPC cuff control at 20 mils of mercury or nothing was used. And this was observed across both upper and lower body multi-joint exercises. 
Similarly, ischemic preconditioning resulted in a greater total volume of work performed compared with the cuff control and no treatment at all. Although the authors didn't study any kind of physiological mechanisms that underpinned the results that they saw here, they did go on to highlight a few different mechanisms they thought may have been involved. And I just want to highlight a couple of them. And the first one is actually changes in hemodynamics. And in particular, they highlighted one author, Paradis Deschains et al., where they evaluated the effects of IPC on muscle oxygenation and hemodynamics during maximal contractions. The results showed that an increase in total strength and a higher speed of deoxygenation of hemoglobin with IPC. And these improvements seem to be due to higher blood reperfusion at rest and during maximal contractions that promoted greater extraction of oxygen from the circulation. Furthermore, the authors concluded that based on the findings that the alterations were directly linked to vasodilation of type 2 muscle fibers. And similarly, another author, Tanaka et al., found that IPC accelerated the deoxygenation of hemoglobin in capillaries of the exercising muscles during knee extension exercise, resulting in increased time to fatigue in an isometric exercise test. Additional physiological mechanisms that might also be involved in the improved performance with IPC have been proposed include improved mitochondrial metabolism, which is what Sam spoke about, and reduced neurological inhibition. As with all good papers that we read in the discussion, the authors will also cite other papers that are also similar in nature. And in particular here, they mention one paper that I was almost going to review and it was kind of fitting that I might as well just mention it here in the discussion. So it's, I guess, a bit of a double whammy here. And it's actually two papers and really a quite an interesting thing here. Marcolo and their group has done a lot in the IPC type work. And what this group in particular looked at is they investigate the effects of ischemic preconditioning on the number of repetitions over three maximal sets of knee extensions. And in the second study, they investigate the effect of IPC on performance over four sessions of a 12 repetition maximum test of elbow flexion exercise. And in particular, this author found something a little bit different. There are two different studies that they stated in the discussion. The first one where they investigated the effects of IPC on the number of repetitions over three maximal sets of knee extensions. So that's lower body knee extensions. And in the other study, they investigated the effect of IPC on performance over four sessions of a 12 repetition test of elbow flexion, so that's upper body. In these studies, both the IPC and the cuff treatment resulted in a great number of repetitions completed compared with the no cuff control conditions, but there was no difference in the number of repetitions between IPC and cuff. This is really interesting, so potentially a placebo effect with just using the cuff. This group in particular suggested that the effects of IPC could be more motivational than potentially physiological. And the current paper that I reviewed, they had no physiological markers. So it's hard to allude to what's potentially going on here. The authors went on, therefore it's possible that especially since a true sham condition for the cuff cannot be implemented, it's important to emphasize that the studies by Marcolo involve different methodological approaches than the current study. In particular, the previous studies performed up to three sets of 12 repetitions using one single joint exercise performed unilaterally. That was the knee extension or the elbow flexion. Also in the studies by Marcolo, they were short and the training volume was relatively low and therefore the energy contribution could be characterized as predominantly anaerobic. And this is an important distinction as the current literature shows little or no effect of IPC on performance in exercises in sessions that rely primarily on anaerobic energy contribution. On the other hand, traditional resistance exercise sessions involving the major muscle groups rely on substantial energy contribution from aerobic metabolism, especially during longer duration and high volume sessions. And in particular, if we look at this study, the volume of the resistance exercise training sessions was much greater and the sessions lasted much longer than the Marcolo studies because it included the six multi-joint exercises, each with three sets until concentric failure at a high 80% of 1RM load. Another really good point here that they brought up in the discussion 
was that the IPC protocol used in the current study involved occlusion of only the upper arm. And positive effects were also seen in performance for the lower limb exercises as well. This demonstrates a remote benefit from IPC. And such beneficial effects of remote ischemic preconditioning on strength performance has also been previously reported in other papers, in particular for grip and single joint exercises. And straight away when I read this here, I was thinking climbing sports. Has anyone out there ever done any kind of upper body BFR or more importantly, ischemic preconditioning for climbing? I think it'd be really interesting if anyone's out there, has a set of cuffs and is into climbing, if it actually helps in any kind of way there. Again, here in the discussion, they spoke about rate of perceived exertion. There was no difference here. My point here without going to discussion is it's going to be tough anyway. And I think if you go into muscular failure, irrespective of whether you have some kind of physiological benefit from using cuffs or not, I think it's going to be high and, and hence that didn't really surprise me. In closing, the practical application, I'm going to read it straight from the paper. I think it sums up really quite nicely. The application of ischemic preconditioning increased the number of repetitions and total volume performed during resistance exercise training sessions without affecting perceived exertion and regardless of local or remote application site for occlusion. These findings could have more important implications for athletes and others who engage in resistance exercise training because increased performance during training could lead to increased desirable adaptations such as strength and hypertrophy. Therefore, strength and conditioning professionals should consider the inclusion of ischemic preconditioning into their resistance exercise training programs. I agree. As you know, I've used BFR for quite some time and very, very rarely have I ever had anyone who has had a negative experience from it. And most people who use BFR, whether it's passively or actively, say that they feel better using it. And on my other podcast, BFR Radio, I had Tony Lewis who spoke about some of the clients that he uses BFR with and he had one gentleman in particular who was coming back from a hip operation and that's how they started off using BFR is just using it passively using some form of ischemic preconditioning not to full occlusion but rather they used up to 50% of arterial occlusion and he actually found that the uh, client actually had some form of benefit of just using it passively for a few weeks. And that when they actually got into the session using it actively, that they were actually able to get into this type of training a lot easier doing exercises with it. Therefore, there is some sort of benefit. We don't seem to be doing anything negatively as long as our processes with BFR are correct. Again here, I'm really glad I searched a little bit harder for this paper. It's a lot more practical and applied to what we would typically give the athletes or clients that we train. An actual session with six exercises using a good solid load. So really happy with that. So a great paper. Hope you enjoyed that one today. Uh, I think in the last podcast, we said that this should, I think is around episode 100 and I was hoping to get Jared on, but I'm really keen to get through this little mini series and um, with Jared finishing off his thesis, we'll get through this IPC group and we'll have a little bit of a, a celebration of the milestone of 100 episodes. So thank you for joining us for 100 episodes. Thank you also to Elite Form for sponsoring the podcast. We're really gracious for their support, for help supporting this podcast and this concept. Thank you to Jared for putting up with me for 100 episodes. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you in two weeks.